I'm recording it. It's all good. Awesome. All right. A little technical difficulties there. Sorry about that. Um, but thank you all student athletes who are joining us uh, for this for this uh, last class of our NIL um, educational series. We have Zach Miller, who's a former ASU football player, former NFL football player, as well as, as, well as uh, Eric Averill um, is a former ASU baseball player. They're here to just talk about all things finances and taxes as it relates to NIL um, and the monies that you guys may have been earning throughout this uh, this new era. Um, so really, I don't have much to say. Me and Whitney don't have much to, to add to this conversation. So we'll just get it over to the professionals and let them uh, let them handle it. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I was uh, at uh, Sun Devil from 2004 to 2006, was an All-American, got drafted in the second round uh, by the Oakland Raiders, had an had a eight-year NFL career, made a Pro Bowl in Oakland, won a Super Bowl with the Seahawks, and then... Um, you know, was for a while was the highest paid tight end in the NFL. And so uh, post-career went back to school, got my finance degree, and then, um, you know, was lucky to be, um, you know, did the certified financial planner uh, certification, uh, passed that exam over two years ago and got linked up with Eric Averill, who played baseball um, just before me, 2003 to 2005 at ASU, um, you know, standout pitcher, had a chance to play professional baseball. Um, and luckily he, like me, um, you know, found himself in the wealth space. He actually started at Morgan Stanley and realized that um, that's not the best place to help athletes. So him and his brother founded an independent RIA um, centered around what's doing best for athletes. So, um, you know, I, I always tell him that you know, of all the playbooks I got, I was never given a playbook on money. I had plenty of playbooks on, on, you know, running uh, the right out routes, blocking the right guy, but no one along the line gave me a, a real playbook playbook for money. And, uh, and so we'll cover some NIL uh, stuff that, that comes up with that taxes, what, what you can do with your money, um, you know, when you're fortunate enough to make with NIL. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll just kind of run it that way. And then um, for sure, if anyone has questions, put them in the chat or make sure you, um, jump in if we're going too fast or you want something explained better um, feel free to jump in the chat ask the question um, or speak up um, so i guess the um really what when we when we talk about money so many people want to you know as eric and i are both investment advisors we kind of get lumped into this like so you guys pick stocks and so i think the what the biggest thing that we can do is high level um, explain what what it is um, money is used for. And so, Eric, if you want to walk through kind of high level how how we think about money um, and and what why it's important in life is is one of the I think the best things you can understand from an early age, whether you're lucky enough to play professional sports or just work um, you know work and earn money the rest of your life in whatever business uh, endeavor you chase. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Um, and uh, Zach, do you mind giving me the ability to share my screen? Um, I, so yeah, first, I, I think first, you should be able to now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, first off, uh, thanks thanks for having us. As, as Zach Miller said, uh, Sun Devil at heart. So I love the opportunity to, to hopefully give back. Um, and one of the key things I've learned and Zach's learned through our own professional careers into now what we do of getting to uh, partner with student athletes and professional athletes is what we know is we need not only the talent to be able to be successful in whatever game we're playing, we actually need the, the right personnel, um, we need the right front office, and then what we would say is the right playbook. And so, so often uh, what happens is, is if we jumped into this conversation of telling you exactly what are write-offs and what are, what's going to happen in the taxes, we can kind of lose the force through the trees. And so what I'm going to do here is there's an actual playbook and a formula on how to build wealth. So when we take a step back and say, what is money? At the end of the day, money is just a tool to pay for things, right? It's, it's a tool to pay for the things that are important to you today, save so you can pay for things in the future, and then ultimately also impact the people and the causes that matter most to you. And very similar to health, you're going to hear these analogies a lot, uh, a lot is, is 
the playbook is actually not that complicated. The hard thing, right, to put on muscle or to be in shape is the discipline to lock in our nutrition and our recovery or our lifestyle and to make sure that we follow through on the plan that's in place. Um, and money's no different. And so what I'm going to lay out here is what we call is the net worth formula. Um, as Zach said, stop me, interrupt me with what, what questions you have. Um, we'll try to do a really good job of providing uh, definitions. Um, so can you guys, let me make sure you can see a big blank white, white screen right now. Yep, we can, Eric. Great, great, cool. So the, the first thing that we're doing here is, right, is how to build wealth. And I'll make sure, just so you know, we will send out a copy of this to everybody. So hopefully you're taking notes, but if you're not, we'll make sure you have this and all the other resources that we're gonna, that we're gonna cover. But the first thing that all of us know as athletes is we actually just start out as people, right? We, we come into this world and uh, most of us don't have any money in our bank account. And so what we spend the first 18 to 22 years of our life doing is making ourselves valuable. Um, as an athlete, we understand this, that um, what makes us valuable in this conversation right now of why people want to offer endorsement incomes or NIL deals is that they look at you as a student athlete and say, you provide some type of value that's going to help my company make more money because of the platform and eyeballs that you have in society. And so this is a very good thing. The physical standpoint is the more valuable I am, like Zach was. He was drafted you know, by the Oakland Raiders and then ended up signing a you know, 30 plus million dollar deal. That's because of his physical skill set. Um, we also know that we're more than an athlete. Um, and so there's what's called intellectual capital. So this is, this is hopefully what you're sharpening your mind in the classroom and you're doing is understanding that at some point as your physical capital drops, if you think of Magic Johnson here, or you think of Michael Jordan, or you think of Derek Jeter, these are now Tom Brady, all these elite athletes uh, that at some point they don't play the sport anymore, but they also invested now in their business acumen to make themselves valuable, not just during their careers, but far beyond. And then the third component is what we would also call your social capital. And so your social capital is your ability to just leverage your network of relationships. And the reason that we always want to start here is the first thing that you have control over is investing in yourself. So you choosing of what to put in your mouth, right, or, or whether to sleep has direct implications on your ability to perform physically. What classes you take, what books you read, what podcasts you listen to impacts the value of your intellectual capital. And then this social component, we know this. The beautiful thing about being an athlete is doors will open for us that don't open for the general public. And this is so important for us to leverage. And where this connects is during this NIL conversation, you've heard a lot of people talking about building a brand. Well, if we ask the question what a brand is, a brand is actually just a natural outcome of what an underlying business is. So a good thing for you as the athlete in this NIL space or in the future is to ask, what value am I providing to a company that makes them want to partner or do business with me? Because if we take a step back and ask what we're doing as a business, we are paying money to people to help us be more profitable. And so the first investment you can think of is really, how do I earn money? This is the first skill that every person needs to figure out is, is how do I develop the skill set to earn money? And it's really the combination of these three things that is going to make you valuable both on and off the field or the court. Any questions so far? I just want to pause. I'll wait a second. If it's silent, I'll keep moving forward. Cool. So, so what happens here 
is the world or a team or a company figures out, you know what, Zach Miller's really valuable. I want to, I want to do a partnership with him. I want to hire him to come play for my team. Or if I'm Nike, I want to endorse Zach Miller. And so we signed this contract. And the reason I think that this is really important is, is it produces something called active gross income. Now the word gross, all that means is before tax. And so we're going to get into this NIL conversation around tax, but I think most of you have heard that what you are paid necessarily isn't what hits your bank account or doesn't hit your pocket. And the reason is, is let's say you do an NIL deal for $10,000, you're going to be issued something called a 1099 because you're an independent contractor. All that means is you're your own business. Uh, another term would be sole proprietor. So single kind of proprietor, single business owner, you get this $10,000. It is now your responsibility as the, as the business owner to make sure that we are paying in our taxes to the right places. The thing about this active gross income Active is, is what it is today. It's not where we want to go. The ultimate kind of conclusion at the end of the road is we're actually working to build this system to create something called passive income. All passive means is, is you don't have to work for it anymore. It's called mailbox money. It's while you're sleeping, you're making money. And that's what this formula is going to get us to. But at this point in the equation, we have to work, right, to, to earn our money. Once we hit this gross income, usually, as Zach had mentioned, when we usually think about financial advice, our brain jumps straight to investments. And investments are very important, but the first destroyer of wealth is actually tax. And what we like to say is that tax is guaranteed and certain, meaning you're either going to owe a dollar or you're not. And so there's a lot of value in locking in, making sure we're paying the least amount of tax possible, whereas investments are very educated, but there's still a hope that something will happen in the future. And so the reality is, is this first thing that happens is tax. And so specifically on the NIL standpoint, uh, the rule is, is, is if you owe or if you earn $400 or more of net earnings, you are required to file a tax return. And this is really important. So when you uh, do a deal, you've probably filled out something called or been asked to fill out a form called a W-9. What this form is saying is, is all right, Zach, we're Nike and we want to deal, do a deal with you, Zach. We're going to pay you $10,000 please fill out this form that gives me your social security number so that I, Nike, can now report to the IRS that I paid Zach Miller $10,000. And so when you're filling out this form, it's really giving the company an ability to report information to the government and then also to send you during tax time what you receive is called the 1099. So if you earn $400 or more, you have to file a tax return this does not mean that you owe tax. It just means that there is a requirement to file. Um, I'm going to pause real quick. Anybody on the ASU team or student athletes, any questions on any of that so far? I actually have a clarifying question, Eric, in regards to this. Um, when you're saying this, this $400 net um, income you're required to file, um, is that specifically for sole proprietors and, and 1099 forms? Great question. That is, yeah, the answer is yes. So the requirement, if you did not have any 1099 income, the alternative for those listening is you could actually be an employee of a company. So you would have something called W-2 wages. What that means is I work for a company. So in this instance, Zach Miller worked for the Seattle Seahawks. I worked for the Detroit Tigers. I got a paycheck every two weeks and the employer was responsible for to, to take taxes out of my paycheck. Um, in this case, on the NIL side of the things, as our student athletes, we're going to be earning 1099 independent income. 
And that's what triggers such a low amount of money earned. Does that answer your question, Zach? Yeah, thank you. Great. So what we also like to say is tax is not all bad. Tax is a symptom of income. So the fact that you have to pay tax means you're earning income, which is a good thing. What we want to say is, is that what we don't want to do is pay any unnecessary tax. And so this is where it comes into if you have earned NIL income or you have an opportunity in the future, keeping track of things is really important. So some very basic stuff that we would encourage you that you set up a separate bank account that all of your NIL income gets deposited into and any expenses that you would um, incur to earn that money, you are tracking through this account so that you can write it off, which means reduce the, how much income you're gonna pay. So in a lot of these NIL deals, you may be using a marketing agent. Uh, if that agent's charging you 10 to 20%, on that example, I earn $10,000. The marketing fee is $2,000. I don't pay tax on $10,000. I do $10,000 minus the agent fee. So now I have $8,000 of gross income, adjusted gross income, and that's what I pay my tax on. So it's really important that we're making sure we're tracking our expenses. And we'll be able to provide a list you know, after the follow-up call of what are the type of write-offs that we can talk about? But this is a this is a really important kind of step in the process. So, um, as an example, just kind of that we had talked about is let's have a situation where you know, for round numbers, an athlete earns fifty thousand dollars of income. In this situation, they're going to end up paying tax. And what we realize is nobody explained this to me when I was, uh, it was an athlete coming out of it. We have what's called a graduated tax rate, meaning we pay taxes based off of kind of what level of income we make. And it's not a flat tax, it's a progressive tax. And so, you know, there's a situation where when you make a certain amount of money, I think it's when you make less than $10,000, you're going to pay 0%. When you make over 10K, you start to pay 10% in tax, then 15, then 18, then there's 20%. So in this situation, what you're kind of looking at is, is based off of how much income you make, you're, you're going to start to apply how much tax that you pay in this situation. And, and Zach can get into uh, bringing up the actual federal tax brackets for you guys to be able to look at it. But this is a really important part of the situation. And what I want to demonstrate real quick of like how big of tax planning can be. So going back to this example, let's say we have an athlete that just crushes it on the NIL side, right? Somehow figures out how to earn $100,000. In this situation, uh, for round numbers, let's say they're going to pay $24,000 in taxes because they're in the 24% rate, right? That leaves in my pocket $76,000 that I take home to my house, right? So we'd say, hey, this is, a, this is a good thing. But there's actually a situation where you can do something which is called setting up your own retirement account or your 401k. And so in this situation, what the rule says is, is I can actually put up to $60,000 into a 401k, which is a type of investment account that we'll talk about. Um, but now in this situation, my starting point, instead of paying taxes on $100,000, I'm starting to pay taxes on $40,000. And now my kind of tax rate's probably closer to 15%. So I might end up only actually paying $4,500 in tax. So I'd end up with $33,500 in my bank account. And I actually have $60,000 in my investment account. And so I just demonstrate this to show you that if we're proactive and we have a plan, there is a way to reduce the amount of tax that you pay. I'll pause there. I know I'm sprinting through this, 
Um, so hopefully this is helpful, but any questions so far? Cool. All right. So mo moving on kind of like we would say, going back to this situation is skill number one is to learn how to earn money. Skill number two is how to minimize your taxes. Skill number three is we're going to say what's called win cash flow game. Hey, Eric, I got a quick question. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, in, in kind. So said athlete gets $200 every month for free pizza. How does that, how does that come in? Great, great question. So this is, this is an area that we even see with our professional athletes kind of catching, catching them off guard a little bit. So from the government's perspective, whether I as an athlete receive actual cash or in kind, there is a value to that free pizza, right? $200 a month, we're at 2,400 bucks of free pizza. That company is still required to issue you what's called a 1099. So if you have anything that's given to you a value that's $600 or more, they're gonna report that to the, to the IRS. You'll receive this 1099 form. Even though you didn't receive cash, you are gonna report that as income because you received the benefit of it. And where this becomes important is, let's say over the year, you add up a bunch of these $600 deals and you get uh, $15,000 in income, you will owe tax on 15 grand. That means you wanna make sure you have enough cash flow to pay the tax liability. Where we see this actually catching some athletes uh, off guard and uh, I, can, I can take a swing at, at the baseball players because I'm a former player. College baseball players, nobody's probably uh, doing a deal to give me a, a brand new car. Um, but maybe our football players and our basketball players, a local car dealership's going to give you the right to drive a, a, a brand new car uh, that's valued at $125,000. You are going to have to pay tax on the value of that car if they've theoretically gifted or you've done a deal for that car. And so you have to think through what's the tax implication on the $125,000 car do I have enough cash to pay for that? And so does that answer your question on the in-kind gifts? Yes, thank you. And I'll just jump in there. There's been a lot of, I mean, a lot of the NIL deals are giving um, free clothing, free merchandise, things like that. So if, you, if you're working with a marketing agent and they're not actually, um, they're not putting it into the contract that you have, some for them to cover the tax bill that's associated with that, you know, you might run into a cash crunch when it comes tax time. If they send you a 1099 and you owe taxes on it and you don't have the cash for it, it's just something to really look out for. Um, so as Eric's writing right now, um, any, any expected taxes, the rule of thumb is you got to save 25% um, of, of whether that's cash or if you're getting non-cash compensation, um, use of vehicles, uh, merchandise, free gear, free and free anything. Um, that that's payment for services in in the NIL space, and they're use they they're expecting um, you to perform service services for them, and then you're going to go ahead and um, you know get whatever free gear that is. There's going to be a tax bill associated with that, and so you want to make sure um, you know if you can get it in the contract, your your marketing agent can get it in the contract that the company will cover your tax bill. That's just going to be more money for you at the end of the day. The end of the day. Otherwise, you're going to have to come up with that tax money um, when it comes tax filing time. The, the other thing I, I want to add around the tax side with NIL, because this is a question that comes up a lot is, so there's, there's really three levels of tax that you're going to pay as a taxpayer. So the first is self-employment tax. So there's a situation where you may actually not make enough money to, to owe any money to the federal government um, in, a, in a federal income tax, but 
you will always owe self-employment tax, which means you may have heard this word social security or Medicare. So the way that the government funds social security and Medicare is through kind of this level of tax. And so first and foremost, you're, if you earn at least $400, you're gonna end up paying some level of, of Medicare and social security tax. Once you've earned kind of north of $15,000, um, you're going to end up having a federal tax liability. And then the third level is your individual state or the states in which you earn the money. And so you are always responsible to pay tax to your state where you are a resident of. And so what I mean is when you go home for fall break or you go home for the summer, whatever state you return to, that is your resident state. So I grew up in Southern California. I played at Arizona State. In that situation, my resident state is California. So even if I'm in Arizona and I do an NIL deal with a Phoenix-based company, you know, that for whatever you know, reason, local, you know, I do a deal with Zips and restaurant, California still gets to lay claim of taxing that amount of money because I'm a resident of their state. So residency is a very important thing. Um, and then there's just the questions of kind of the devils are in the details in your agreement with the company of where you're gonna earn that money. So I just encourage you whenever you sign a deal, not only have the marketing agent, but make sure you have a qualified certified public accountant, something called a CPA. That's, that's helping you understand the tax implications of the deal that you're doing. So kind, kind of moving on here of, all right, you guys have done a great job. We paid the least amount of tax. This is what hits our pocket. And this is net income. So net just means after tax, um, which is a really good thing. So what we talk about here is winning the cash flow game. And when you hear of athletes or people who end up in bad situations who've made millions of dollars and you go like, How, how'd that happen, right? How are they having financial difficulty? It's primarily because they lose this game. And what I mean by this is there's only four uses of money. There's only four ways you can spend money. And this is true if you make a billion dollars or if you make a thousand dollars, right? I think back to when, when we had our loo checks, which... I don't know. I remember, I think 2005, it was like a thousand bucks, 800 bucks. I had to make a decision how I was going to spend my 800 bucks on campus. You only have three options. The first one is you can spend your money on lifestyle. This is not a bad thing, right? Like I want to eat and I want to be able to do things. These are priorities of mine. The, the, the reality is though, is once a money leaves my bank account, it's not coming back in, right? It's gone. And so I don't have any left. The second is what we would say is you can share your money. So this could be charitable, which we believe is great. You want to help out a family member. You want to donate to something you care about. It's really good. And it's a healthy thing to do. However, very similar to the spending, once that money leaves your bank account, it's gone. So the third category is what we say is, is you can save your money. And this is where you have the opportunity to grow your money. And so in this situation, budgeting becomes very simple. If I have $100, I've only got three buckets that I can go into, right? It can go into one, two, or three, and that's it. And so this is where we would encourage you is, is having a plan. So even if it's only 100 bucks or it's 1000 bucks a month, or you start making a lot of money, is you putting this into place. And that fourth bucket, right, is, is you owe tax. So if $25 goes into my tax bucket, I now have $75 to kind of split between the three of these. And this principle applies to everybody. Our clients that are making $20, $30 million a year, we literally sit down and we have the same exact conversation. So this rule is, is you spend less than you make, which is a huge thing. And then the second thing is, is really when we start to talk about passive income or the power of investing, like why do I even care to get money into a savings account? 
is because it's essentially this is where we start to talk about your money working for you while you're sleeping. This is something called investment, investing your money by buying ownership of companies. So I buy ownership of a company and I get to grow my money. So as an example, there's this really cool rule called the rule of 72. And what the rule of 72 says is, let's say you guys are able to save $1,000 over the entire year, right? This is less than 100 bucks a month. And you say, man, this is awesome. I got 1,000 bucks into my account over, over a year at when I was at ASU. And I did that when I was you know, a, a freshman. So I was 19 years old. Well, what this rule says is that if I earn 7.2% annually on my investments, my money will double every 10 years. So when I'm 29, I now have $2,000. When I'm 39, I have $4,000. When I'm 49, I have 8,000. When I'm 59, I have $16,000. And so this is the power of investing. And so you talk about kind of compound interest is if I get $1,000 into my investment account today, I don't have to work so hard to earn $4,000 down the road. And this is a really, really important thing for you to really see, even if you're starting with $10 of investing, just get started. And I think this is really about starting habits, right? We know this, that it's hard to go into a gym we don't load up the plates on the side of the squat rack and be like, cool, I'm going to PR day one. It's like we start somewhere and we grow, right? It's more about the consistent habit of getting some money into an account. So even if it's, it sounds wild, but even if you can only get $5 into a savings account, like start that habit as quick as possible. Any questions so far? Cool. Another kind of, uh, I guess, rule I would, I would say on here is, you know, once we get this money invested, this is where you can start to talk about investing. And if you notice, a lot of times people are going to talk about investing in the very beginning. And it's very important, but this is the least complicated part of it. Yet this is where a lot of people can take advantage of you. And this is where you can actually lose a lot of your money. So what we say is, you know, you've worked really hard to make yourself valuable um, in your human capital up here. And so you've done the hard work of actually getting money into the system down to savings. What you don't want to do is take this money that you've worked really hard for and then go invest it in something that doesn't really have a lot of evidence that it's going to grow. Um, and so an example like this would be is you probably don't want to take this money and go drop it in a bunch of cryptocurrency, right? Um, it's, it's more of learning, okay, what is kind of one over the long term? And then asking questions like, why should I believe this is going to go up in valuable? Why is this going to become more valuable? Um, and so that's just like a really caution, word of caution is there's no real like get rich quick scheme. Um, it's, it's the long kind of boring way to, to grow your wealth. Um, and then what I would say just to kind of connect this is once you invest, this will eventually create what we, uh, what we know as, as passive income. And once you have enough money in your investment account, it will actually start to generate your income so that you, you don't have to have a job. And so this is kind of like how you build wealth um, from, a, from a high level framework. So hopefully this is helpful. I know a lot of this is new um, and we sprinted through this, but any questions so far before we dive a little bit more into kind of NIL and tax? No questions so far? Cool. Um, 
Zach, yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen now and just kind of run through the tax implications just to explain the tax code in general. Cause a lot of, I mean, I, as a young player, I didn't understand the tax code truthfully. Um, you know, I wasn't filing taxes when I was a collegiate athlete. So I didn't understand um, even just how the tax system works and where you're going to pay all of your taxes. If you get some good NIL money, even um, you're going to have to file a return. So let me share my screen and all right, can you see this? Yep. All right, so as Eric was talking about earlier, we have our federal tax bracket. So you're not gonna be penalized for making um, a little bit of money as you get as you're lucky enough to make more money you go down i mean you go down the tax brackets until you know if you're lucky enough to be a professional athlete you're going to be in the 37 percent tax bracket uh, more than likely um, collegiate athletes student athletes are going to be earning anywhere from you know a few hundred bucks to a few thousand to maybe 50 to a hundred thousand for some of the best ones out there uh, i'm sure the money will keep going up but it's just Something to think about is you're going to have federal taxes, you're going to have state taxes, and then there's the payroll taxes Eric briefly mentioned. So as you think about complexity when it comes to taxes, it's not as simple as just, oh, I made some money, I got to pay the federal government, or I'm going to have a tax bill due come April. Um, you, you, you will have to file a tax return. If you get any 1099 sent to you, you make any money for the most part, you're gonna to have to file a tax return. And then understanding that you, there's, there's, okay, we'll talk a little bit about itemized deductions versus the standard deduction. So just because you make 10 grand doesn't actually mean you're gonna pay tax on that money. You get the standard deduction of $12,550 that will wipe out your earnings. And so you essentially, won't have to pay tax, federal tax at least, on that first little bit of income. So just something to be aware of. Um, it's called the marginal tax bracket, and it just your marginal rate is whatever that last dollar is taxed at. Just something to th to think about, um, as opposed to your average tax rate or your effective tax rate is kind of your how much taxes you paid for that year as a tax rate. So um, Arizona's highest rate is four and a half percent. California, obviously high, New York high. Um, I was lucky to play in Washington where there was no state income tax. So you do, if you, when you earn, when I earned money as a Seattle Seahawk in games that were played in Washington, I did not have to pay tax on my earnings um, that were, that were, that came from the state of Washington. Now there's something called a jock tax, and this can apply to some NIL deals that if you're a resident of somewhere, you're going to have to pay file a tax return and possibly pay taxes in that state um, and then possibly either have to pay taxes in another state where you actually earn the income or perform or perform the nil services whether that's showing up and making an appearance and they pay you or um, you know on your college campus if you're a resident of somewhere else and your parents are you know claiming you as a dependent on their tax return in another state you're going to have some complexity when it comes to state tax returns and you know these states they like to to raise revenue so there's certain amount there's certain thresholds each state is different and so you have to understand that there's a certain amount of money that if you make they will try to get that state tax money from you from your earnings on your nil deal so uh just something to be aware of when it comes to federal plus state and then as we talked about, as you're a 1099 employee, you're a sole, propri sole proprietor, and you're going to have the self-employment taxes, which are commonly called payroll taxes, sometimes referred to as Social Security and Medicare. Those are going to come out of, of your earnings as it goes through onto your tax return. So just be aware that's, and, and it's why we harp on um, with, you know, no matter what, how much money you make, keeping the most amount of it is the most important because it's 
it's it's it's when it comes to investments you have to risk your money to get a return with taxes if you do proper tax planning you actually aren't taking any extra risk you're just keeping more of the money that you already earned and then you can go use it on the things that you care about so um these this is kind of just understand the complexity of the st the tax code and then the true professionals that focus on 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 nil and athletes are experienced and have the right expertise to be able to uh, deal with multi-state taxation and NIL and understanding the contracts that come through there and even um, can can work with a marketing agent to make the, it the most favorable to you, the, the taxation as favorable as possible to you so you end up with more money in your pocket. Um, just kind of deadlines to be aware of. So your NIL taxes, you're gonna be an independent contractor. That's going to trigger the 1099. So, you know, even if you don't, if you're not going to pay the IRS, if you're not going to cut the IRS a check, you still have to file. And if you don't, you'll pay penalties and interest. So it, you may not have, you may not have a tax liability, but failing to, to, pay, to file the taxes, um, will can, it's, it's called failure to file. And then they're going to accrue interest for all the time in between you when you didn't file and what the penalty was. So be proactive. If you made any money in 2021, any any 1099s have been coming in last month or, or the month before, um, be aware that you have a deadline coming up. So you wanna start planning now. A lot of CPAs, which is a certified public accountant that uh, we recommend, uh, you know, everyone use a CPA and a qualified CPA to deal with the the, the taxation of this, make sure that you're not waiting till the last minute because some of those CPAs can't get it done in, in the amount of time and then you have to extend and then you're running into um, something that shouldn't have been an issue being in, being an issue. Um, so be proactive on this side. Uh, Eric, anything on the taxes you think? Um, no, so so what I would say here is I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen uh, back in a, a second when Zach stopped sharing is we covered a lot like we know in the last four to five minutes we sprinted through probably uh, finances uh, finance class 101 202 and 303 um, and wouldn't expect you guys to remember all of this stuff so there's some resources that are freely available for you that that we just want to point you towards. Um, and so the the first one uh, that you just will want to be aware of um, is for for those uh, that do want to read, um, there are uh, blogs that we have that literally say tax write off for athletes. What is the jock tax? So this talks about how you're taxed in every state that that you earn money in. Um, all the way to, you know, NIL and how NILs, uh, NIL deals are taxed. Um, and so we'll make sure that obviously the, the team uh, distributes this for you guys. Um, so if you want to read, this is where all the details at, freely available right on the website. You just type in awmcap.com up here or on whatever you listen to your podcasts on, whether it's Apple, Spotify, literally type in Athlete Wealth podcast and Zach, myself, uh, Aaron Goldberg, who runs our golf division, uh, has all the detail you could ever want to know about NIL and just building money in general as an athlete. Um, and so both of those resources are freely available for you guys and hopefully will become very helpful for you. Um, any, any, you know, kind of questions at this point, we, I think we've we've probably taken you through as much detail as you want. Hopefully it's been helpful, but any questions from anyone? Let me uh, just interject here. Uh, beautiful Sun Devils, this is outstanding, very understandable, and very intentional content. This is perhaps one of the things that gets people caught up the most. So let's take some time here. If you all have some questions for these beautiful human beings, Please ask them right now. Let's not, let's not lose this opportunity. Brady, anything we need to be mindful of? I know you got NIL folks in your space. 
No, thanks. Thanks so much for this. This is was super helpful. Um, I think the hardest part talking with our team is um, it's definitely not a popular topic amongst them. So I think the re-emphasizing um, with this and hitting them daily and I'm on it and I think was huge and pointing them to these resources that I'm going to, the AWM and everything, I think we'll, we'll hit home for them. But so I appreciate you taking the time because this was, this was good stuff. Ricardo, where's your head at? You look reflective there. <clears throat> I'm just listening, boss. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. How about Kate, Andre, Elijah? What y'all thinking? Uh, this was pretty helpful. Um, actually, now that I got the chance, I do have a question. He was going over the 7.2 rule about um, investments in stocks. How do I like uh, know beforehand that this will work or that this is one of those 7.2s that work? Great, great question. Um, so the the short answer is we'll, we'll make sure that there's some resources for you. Um, there's uh, the, the, the best way to do it is what I would say is you're going to want to invest in having ownership of what's called publicly traded available kind of stocks and bonds. So when you hear the public stock market um, and there's companies like Vanguard, which is this, this big name that essentially says we can help you have ownership of companies in a very safe way spread across lots of different companies um, that are all publicly traded. Um, that is the way to do it um, And the, at this time. What I would tell you is where most athletes and individuals get in trouble and risk a lot of their money and probably don't realize they're risking it is in what are called private investments. So these are companies that you cannot access online through the public stock market. These are like the local startup business, or if you've ever seen Shark Tank on TV, um, those are something called venture capital. The word venture literally means risk, risk capital. Um, and so I would caution you that the best place to start is actually learning how to invest in the, in the public stock market. Um, I think you guys can see, see my screen. Um, there's a book that you can tell uh, we reference a lot here. Um, it's called The Five Mistakes Every Investor Makes. This is the Bible on investing. This is the one thing that if everybody read this book, they would know more than 99% of the people in the world and they would be as close as possible to investing like Warren Buffett compared to kind of people that are trying to get rich quick. So. We'll make sure to include this as well, um, but this is this would be this is must reading resource for anybody who wants to build wealth. Yeah, and I'll I'll just tell my own, my own personal story is, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to be the stock picker right at the end of my NFL career, transitioning into what I do now, and I love investments, I love markets, but I'm also honest enough to admit that there are thousands of professionals all trying to beat each other in the public stock market, which is awesome for investors because it means, you know, companies like Vanguard through index funds have given the ability for investors to be able to put money into a diversified and cheap way to access market returns. And for the average investor, I mean, it's almost a no brainer to, to be diversified, play the long game, don't get caught up. I mean, I wasted hours of my life uh, trying to do stock analysis and picking stocks. And uh, I can tell you from experience that um, even if you could predict those guys, even if you knew that someone was going to outperform, you wouldn't be able to guess ahead of time who's going to do it in, in active management. So the data over, year in and year out, they put it out every year, the S&P 500 um, continues to put the biggest active management places, uh, you know, they lose to, to index investing. And so there are some ways to actually go for better returns, but in the public stock market, oftentimes it's the it's the the most safe and the best way to access markets and grow your wealth because it's really the savings and starting early, having a savings that you constantly invest 
um, as part of your plan and stick to that plan. And then you go and um, put it in, put, just keep putting it to work. And at such a young age, you can grow to huge values, but it's the commitment to do it early um, when you're young and then having a process to continually um, invest. And, in, um, you know, it's all, all of us at AWM are investment advisors. Um, we believe strongly in um, avoiding conflicts of interest. And that's not the way that 90% of the financial industry works. So you, that's probably why you won't hear a lot of the things we say in other places uh, in, in our world. And, and just kind of on resources, so you can learn on, on your own. There's the, some foundational podcasts that literally just talks about why do you even invest? So it's going to talk about that rule of 72, teaching you about growth. Um, it's going to teaching you about the different types of investing, loaning money versus uh, buying ownership and get into what's a stock, what's a bond, what's a mutual fund, what's an exchange traded fund, all the way into like, you know, everything you need to know about Web3 investing. What, it, what is a non-fungible token? What is an NFT? What is a smart contract? And we talk a lot about that of how it relates to an athlete as an endorsement uh, to actually do a deal or maybe launch your own NFT to you investing in NFT projects. And so uh, I'd really just point you to these educational podcasts. Um, they, uh, they, they're, yeah, they're just tremendous. So hopefully they're helpful to you guys. We got any other questions uh, for, for Zach or Eric? All right, I think with that, uh, we're all good. Zach, Eric, thank you guys so much for your time this evening. Uh, the information was really, really helpful, um, really informational. Um, like I said, these these are all being recorded and we're gonna get these up on the on the championship life part of the website, uh, the Sun Double Athletics website. So for all those student athletes that are in here, you'll be able to access this class again, as well as the classes that we had before this one, the three other ones that we did before this. Um, so we'll let you guys know once those are up. Um, but again, Zach, Eric, thank you so much. Thank you guys all for being here um, and have a great rest of your night. Yeah, thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you, gentlemen, outstanding. Thanks, guys. Yep. Great work. Appreciate it. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, good work, Zachary. Appreciate it. Greatest name ever. <laughs> That's right. Later. Good job, team. We did it. Oh. We did it. Wait, let me stop.